Now, I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing our distinguished le lecturer and alumnus of our college, Marvin Romano. Marvin is no stranger to the halls and beautiful campus of our university. In 1977, Marvin graduated with a Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical, in electrical Engineering with great distinction. A few years later, 1980, he returned to campus to, her, to earn his MBA from the Edwards School of Business, or at the time, the College of Commerce. Marvin began his career as a young engineer, as a young engineering graduate, in the oil fields of Alberta with Norkin Energy as a drilling engineer. There he learned to communicate in the language of drilling engineers and field operators, a talent that supported his technical excell excellence later in his career. For the next 15 years, and with an M MBA to help set him apart from everyone else, Marvin advanced through the ranks at Dome Petroleum in Calgary. He moved from reservoir engineer to exploitation engineer to project engineer and ultimately became finance manager. In this role, he facilitated the sale of the company to Amico for $500 million. In 1990, Marvin returned to, returned to his home province of Saskatchewan in leadership roles at Wascana Energy in Regina as their vice president, corporate planning and business development, and later vice Pre president, exploration and production. His success at Wascana Energy was recognized when he was identified as a broad thinking, driven and talented executive and the only viable successor for the role of CEO. However, a hostile bid for the company in 1997 resulted in the sale to Nexon. Marvin then became the vice president of finance for Nexon, which was four times the size of Wascana and was selected over many other candidates. Over the next 15 years, Mar Marvin would leave a lasting impression at Nexon as their Vice President of Finance and Chief Financial Officer, and ultimately as their President and CEO. He led Nexon in three joint ventures with Asian interests, bringing in over $3 billion, $3 billion of investment to the organization. Today, Marvin is active on several boards within the oil and gas community and one charitable organization and is the current is executive in residence at the Edwards School of Business. Throughout his career, he has been described as a thoughtful, driven, and clear-headed executive who tackles complex challenges. He is known for courageously restructuring balance sheets, leadership teams, and asset portfolios to capture remarkable gain. Now, don't get your hopes up. I already asked Marvin what stocks I should be buying, and he's reluctant to say anything. Marvin also possesses a unique and dynamic combination of technical engineering knowledge, financial insight, and leadership experience, making him a natural candidate for advice, innovation, and execution. Marvin is known for achieving optimal business performance while remaining committed to community outreach and development of human capital. His values of integrity, authentic leadership, hard work, and genuine empathy for employees have created workplaces that are founded in trust and prosper accordingly. His story is about strength of leadership and the successful navigation of the challenging waters of Canada's energy sector. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming electrical engineer and alumnus and 2016 CJ McKenzie, distinguished lecturer, Marvin Romano. Good evening. And thank you so much, Lance, for that kind, generous and warm introduction. I especially appreciate you reading it exactly the way I wrote it. <laughs> you usually have to die before people say nice things about you in public. My talk tonight, or lecture as it was billed, is entitled Canada, Energy and Leadership. And it's directed primarily at the engineering students in the crowd. And the rest of you can have a nice nap. The wild cheering 20 minutes from now will tell you it's time to go home, or maybe it's 40 if I ad lib too much. Preparing for an evening like tonight is an important event. So Marv does his homework, and he's going to polish it, and he's going to study it. And my lovely wife Dagmar, sitting right here at the head table, came in from several time zones over last night. She joins me, and she says, Marv, you've got to practice. You gotta deliver it and we gotta polish it up. Ladies and gentlemen, I put her to sleep seven times. <laughs> That's not the end of it. When she awoke, she wanted to give me feedback. 
And she says, Marv, there appear to be a few missing parts here. <laughs> Truth is better than fiction. Thank you, Carl, over here. Where are you sitting, Carl? Carl and I had a chance to talk briefly before the evening. And when you prepare for an event like this, you want to know what did your predecessors do? So I ran into Ron at the airport and asked him, and he wouldn't tell me and said, you're on your own, kid. <laughs> Carl told me that two years ago, your speaker spoke for an hour and a half. And I think he was encouraging me to going a little longer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to go through my speech three times, and it'll be reinforcing if that's how long we're going to be here tonight. Let me begin with a quick comment on leadership. Don't wait until someone dies to say nice things about them. They can't hear you. Leadership is about being positive. It's about being future-oriented. It's about being action-oriented. Even when you have difficult and very challenging things to do, as many of my colleagues do in the energy sector today. My second quick observation on leadership is if you want to close people's ears, lecture to them. I guess that's what I'm going to do here tonight. Discussions are superior. And if you really want to make an impact on people's hearts and minds, you will not do that by what you say. You will only do that by, what you list, by how you listen and what you do with what you hear. Get on someone else's page and you can move mountains. We're going to come back to leadership, but I want to spend a few minutes with what's going on in Canada today. It's important for all of us, and this is from Marv Romano's perspective. But before I begin, many of you have probably heard businessmen speak many, many times before. And they speak about the economy, government, politics, and it usually goes something like this. If government would just cut taxes, balance their budgets, run governments like a business, encourage investment, and if you throw in the word technology in there about four times, you get bonus points, then we would all live in the land of milk and honey. Ladies and gentlemen, if it were that easy, we would have done that. I will try not to follow, fall into that rut tonight, at least not too deeply. Context matters. Context matters, I believe, in all walks of life. And if you want to be leaders, starting with the context of an issue will seldom let you down. Canadian context today is remarkably different than where we were just 18 short months ago. From 2000 to 2014, Canada was riding a commodity wave the size we had never seen before. We were surfing with the greats. It fueled prosperity, it fueled government spending, it fueled personal spending, it fueled borrowing so we could spend more, and interest rates were very low, so we could triple dip. But we seldom asked during that period of time where all of this prosperity was coming from. 18 months ago, 70% of the Toronto Stock Exchange composed of energy companies, pipeline companies, mining companies, and banks. From that perspective, we have a narrow economy. Most Canadians don't appreciate this. And I think part of the reason they don't appreciate this is we are today so entrenched in an anti-carbon dioxide and an anti-hydrocarbon environment, we don't even want to talk about this. With the Canadian dollar losing over 35% of its value, the market understood deeply how our prosperity was sourced. Variations in oil price explain about 87% of the variation in Canadian dollar over the last five to 10 years. For you statistics guys, R squared, 87%. The value of our currency is like the stock price of a nation. When your currency erodes, it's a hidden tax on all of us. Your spending power erodes. Food, travel, products with any foreign content. This is a global economy. We have lots of foreign content and the things we buy are way up. And heaven forbid if you want to eat cauliflower today. 
It was on the news and I was paying attention and it's apparently pricing. No legislation needed to implement this tax hike. I'm not advocating currency controls, but I am trying to paint a clear and accurate picture of where we are today in our country. So what does this mean for leadership? Well, I believe in all walks of life, if you are not deadly honest with yourself about your situation today, whether that's personal, individual, family, corporate, university, whatever, your chances for success are somewhere between miserable and non-existent. This has nothing to do with optimism, has nothing to do with pessimism, it has nothing to do with confidence, it has nothing to do with drive, it has nothing to do with ambition, or a hundred other adjectives I could choose or hope. That's about the future. Those adjectives are about the future. If you have no idea where you stand today, with great clarity, you have no idea in what direction to point yourself to get to your desired future. For over 40 years, surveys of employees, of the public, of any group you want to choose across almost any culture show the same thing. The most admired and demanded characteristics of leaders is honesty. Honesty is not kind. Honesty is not mean. Honesty is not happy, honesty is not sad, it's not personal, it's not positive, it's not negative. It's just straight. It's clear. Many of you young engineers will be leaders, important leaders in important businesses, governments and other institutions. If you have any of these ambitions, harness the honesty within yourself, I promise you. It will not let you down. Back to Canada. In 18 short months, we have gone from a nation where we had close to balanced government budgets to almost record deficits by relative and any absolute standards in Alberta, and we've got now planned deficits at the federal level. Now, deficit spending is generally a good move when the private sector does not have the resources, and that generally means dollars, or the economic investment projects, and if you're in the oil and gas business, at 30 bucks a barrel, things aren't looking very pretty for how economic the next rig uh, you're gonna deploy is, look, is gonna look like, then it generally makes sense for government to fill in that gap, but only if that additional spending is going to be for investment, not consumption. It makes little sense to mortgage your house to pay for groceries. Much more sense to borrow if you're going to grow your earning power tomorrow. And the challenge in Canada has not been to borrow when times are lean, it's been to pay it back when the times have been good. No party, no matter how good the band or the wine, or the conversation, or the music, or the engagement goes on forever. In Canada, we have needed many crises to get our balance sheet in line. Today, I believe Alberta is particularly vulnerable. We have zero debt today. We can borrow for many, many years until we hit that mini crisis of accountability. We have all already started borrowing significantly, and we've had our first warning shot across the bow. Standard & Poor, large credit rating agency in the United States, already reduced Alberta's credit rating by one notch. Moody's, the other big one, put us on credit watch in the province. The downgrade is coming. So my advice, my hope, my suggestion to you as future leaders, wherever you are, is you do a better job than my generation did of managing debt at the personal level, at the provincial level, and at the federal level. I'm not happy with the amount of debt my generation is going to leave to your generation to pay it back. Norway, a resource-rich nation by contrast, has a trillion dollars socked away. One trillion dollars socked away. 
American dollars, the valuable ones. We also have to look a little bit at our own expectations for governments to deliver an ever-increasing standard of living independent of economic contexts. Politics and government is not an easy game. As CEO of Nexon, if I could satisfy shareholders, keep employees happy, keep them engaged, the waters would generally be pretty smooth. In politics, my sense is, and I've never been a politician, so I'm speaking from the outside looking in, my sense is there's a never-ending list of expectations from an equal variety of perspectives that are all bang on on what needs to be done. Everyone wants more, everyone wants something, and everybody wants somebody else to pay. So this desire to satisfy can lead to a lot of mischief in a lot of walks of life, but especially in leaders. Leaders are generally positive. Not all of them, but they're generally positive. Don't stretch this to attempting to satisfy all people at all times. The one certain outcome of this strategy is if you try to satisfy all, I can promise you you'll satisfy none. We live in a world where we need to make choices, however uncomfortable those may be from time to time. A close corollary to this is how we can at times overuse our strengths. Sometimes our faults can get us into trouble. I remember these lists we would get in my early in my career from characteristics from our human resources department that were desirable in an employee. It's 30, 40 items. I was so daunted by this, I was certain I was going to be a failure. I could never be good at 30, 40 things, maybe three. What an intimidating way. And I now teach a few little HR classes, and I think I'm a bit of a rabble rouser. But I love it. The students ask such good questions. But your strengths are your strengths. And what I found in business is the overuse of these at times that gets us into trouble. A good characteristic overused or carried too far has lots of potential. I grew up highly analytical. This is what engineers do. I think I came out of mummy's tummy this way. And at work, when I would walk down the hall, people would say, let's show Marv these two charts. He will really like it. He will be in a good mood. He will like the analysis. They knew me. As you look to hold governments, your colleagues, employees, and yourself to account, be patient. This is one of the most contradictory conundrums in leadership. It's also one of the most rewarding ones. I can give you many examples of where one more exploration well, where patience and money was thin, led to huge rewards. Nexon operated in a country called Yemen in the Arabian Peninsula. Initially there, our discoveries were small, uneconomic, we were disheartened, but we persisted, and we didn't persist for just another well. We persisted for about another three years, and we found an elephant built from parts. We exited the country 25 years later, and we produced over a billion barrels of oil. And at prices of the time, that was about $50 billion of gross revenues coming out of the ground. 80% 80, 80 of that or more went to Yemen. In the early days, we nearly lost our shirts. Investment paid off. It made Nexon one of the most successful ever Canadian-based foreign explorer. I have very few rules of thumb for you of when you should be patient and when enough is enough, when it's time for a new course. However, one thing I've always found, the counsel of others, but not just any others, others who are two things, knowledgeable, and not in the line of fire, to be especially useful. How well you can take counsel of others when you become leaders, especially when it goes against some of your natural grains, some of your natural inclinations, things that you're inclined to do. Just one more chart, guards. Please prepare me one more chart. 
Your ability to take advice against your natural inclinations will be one of the indicators of whether or not you're going to be able to lead. So, this environment we have today, high expectations, high taxes, deficit spending, combined with a bit of a wobbly economy, it reduces our confidence. It reduces business confidence. It reduces everybody's confidence. I sense it when I talk to people. And businesses tend not to hire or invest when their confidence and prospects are poor. So for you young graduates, this may make the first few years of your career a bit challenging. Getting your first job might be tougher than usual. That's okay. You learn five times as much when externalities challenge you. Anyone can sail a boat in calm waters. Real skill, innovation, and learning comes when the waters are rough and unforgiving. I spent over 10 years at Dome Petroleum. It was a remarkable Canadian success story. They made one business mistake. It wasn't a strategic mistake. It was a financing mistake. They financed their last acquisition with debt, not equity, after 35 successful acquisitions. Each deal carries the same new risk, and we lost the company when we went through a down cycle that actually wasn't as big as this one was. I'm still saddened for that particular organization. I want to move on to energy for a few minutes. So for those of you who are in the napping section, we're not quite half done. But my lovely wife here, she is, she is powered and ready for the next half here. Thank you for sticking with me, Dagmar. 35 years, and she still puts up with me in public. She deserves more than a hand. I love you, dear. <laughs> Important forces in energy, and I think business in general, but energy I understand for sure, tend to be long term. Now, don't get sucked into the flavor of the day. If you have doubt, in my industry we discovered oil 160 years ago. The predictions abounded at that time that we were going to get off coal, which was the only available significant energy resource before the discovery of oil. Oil was cleaner. It's twice as energy dense per pound. It produced multiple products, lube oil, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel. It's easier to pump. Winston Churchill has a great quote that I won't go into about the difficulty of coaling a ship. Today, 160 years later, we use more coal than ever before in the history of man. And every forecast I look at for the next 30 years will be using even more coal. So how hard is it going to be knock, to knock off coal, oil, and gas from its pedestal? Well, let's begin with a little history here. The share of coal, oil, and gas as primary energy fuels for our economies has gone from 87% to 84%. In what, the last two years? In the last 30 years. 87% to 84%. That's how much progress we've made 30 years. 75% of the barrel of oil we lift out of the ground winds up as transportation fuels. Gasoline, jet fuel, diesel. This is a remarkable substance. I'm not going to go into all of its characteristics, but just talk a little bit about energy density. You know that lead acid battery in your car that got your car started? It's a block about this big. For an equal weight of gasoline, you have a thousand times more energy than you can stuff into that lead acid battery. That's why it's a miracle fuel. Lithium ion batteries are a little better, about 100 to 1. Batteries are getting better all the time. We might figure it out. In addition to that, going back as little as six years, natural gas is down 80% from the price it was six years ago. You all read in the newspaper, oil is down 70% from where it was 18 months ago. It's abundant, I'll go through that, it's easy to transport, it's available on demand. Today consumers want, they demand, they ask for three things. 
cheap, clean, and secure. Plus, they want 100% of their energy now, right now. So when you plug that kettle into the wall in the morning, you don't say to your spouse, honey, can you call the power company and ask them to send us some electricity now? And the person at the other end says, can you hang on until it gets sunny and windy? Three of the biggest challenges with solar and wind is their intermittent nature, the inability to store electricity easily, and the need for conventional backup when these sources are offline. Solar and wind have very important roles to play in an energy portfolio, but they are not a panacea. Energy systems change slowly. The world is changing. Environmental factors, and I'm gonna spend a few minutes on those, Social expectations, everybody wants more for less. Cheap, clean, secure, pay nothing, now, immediately. And GDP growth is being sourced more and more in industries that are low energy intensive. App development, it's not an energy intensive business. And this is more and more starting to dominate development economies. So I want to move forward from 160 years and what's happening today, because there's been a lot about oil that's been written in the last little while, but I want to go back just a little bit to set up what is actually happening today. And that's another leadership axiom. History is filled with great learning and insight. Don't make the same mistakes twice. Much better to make new mistakes, especially mistakes you can learn from, you can adapt, you can extract something, and you can lever off of that. So beginning in about 1980, there was never a period in humankind beginning right about then, maybe a little before, maybe a little after, where we had larger groups of humanity industrializing. We went from sweating and shivering to all year comfort. We went to buying stuff and moving stuff. And when populations industrialize, their energy consumption goes up exponentially. Now I'm going to go through a few numbers here, and I apologize for this, but I got to deliver a lecture to engineers, and they love numbers. And you nappers, if you're having trouble sleeping, it's better than counting sheep. So in China, per capita oil consumption has gone up by a factor of five in over 30 years, per capita across the whole country. But the country tends, tends to industrialize around the coastal area, so those have grown even more rapidly. Five times as much over 30 years in China, the United States is still 10 times that amount today. So China still has lots to grow. But during this period of industrialization, we had surplus oil production around the world. It was a buffer to prices. That quickly got absorbed. Prices had to rise to ration demand. And there are very few substitutes in the short term for oil. Economists call it inelastic, and simply, you need lots of price change to make any dent in demand. In addition, in our industry, we have very long cycle times. You can't just will a new project, drill the wells, bring it on stream next week. It tends to be long cycle time. So oil goes from $20 to $100 in seven years, 2000 to 2007, 500% increase, and it roughly stays there until 2014, with a brief dip to 35 bucks a barrel during the financial crisis. August 2008, oil peaks at 150 bucks a barrel. The old CEO at Nexon, and he wasn't that old, he announces his retirement. And my first board meeting, oil is 35 bucks a barrel. Life is so unfair. <laughs> if you want to know what I did, you got to walk over to the business school and sit in one of those lectures that are really discussions. But it is an interesting story. What did industry do? Well, we found new sources of supply. We found it in the oil sands. We found it in deep water reservoirs. Nexon held the record for four years for drilling the deepest well in the world. 35,000 feet, 10,000 feet of water. So when you're flying across 
to Calgary or wherever it is you go, imagine that's where the floor of the drilling rig and the reservoir is where you see the farmland that you're crossing over. Six inch steel is like spaghetti string when you're trying to find a reservoir at that depth and drill your wells. We produce a very old product in our industry, but we do it with some of the most remarkable technologies you can imagine. Seismic computing is the most computer intensive industry using more computing power than any competing industry. There is no hair growing on our backs of the kind of technologies we use in our industry to produce a very old product. And the reason we still produce it is we're having a tough time finding something better no matter how much we want, desire it, will it. We just can't manufacture it. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And also, after 130 years of drilling vertically in our industry, we discovered that drilling horizontally was much more rewarding. New technology enabled this old idea to become successful. So we got this windfall in our business as oil goes from 20 to 100 bucks. And just like farming, when you win the lottery, you spend it till it's all gone. We invested that money in finding new sources of supply. And I'll just give you one example. In the United States with horizontal drilling, the United States replaced 40 years of production declines in seven. 40 years of declines getting back to the same production level in seven years. This is the single biggest energy revolution in the last 100 years in conventional hydrocarbons. So the industry did what it's supposed to do, but we did it a little too well. In capital intensive industry, there's no such things as right size finding and the perfect discovery just to fill the market demand. And by 2014, but there were signs earlier, we had all sorts of surplus oil production despite all kinds of trouble in Iran, Iraq, Libya, and all kinds of places in the Middle East that were still keeping about five to 8% of world production capacity offline. As early as 2010, we were starting to see some of these weak signals. This is a fruitful science. If you're interested in how to spot things before they show up, there's a whole area of weak signal analysis that academics are working on. The tough part is, is to tell which weak signal matters and which weak signal doesn't. But pay attention. I think we'll make some progress in that area. But we got weak signals by 2010. Demand growth was slowing partly due to the impact of prices, not completely inelastic. Today, the energy efficiency of an F-150 truck is similar to the Honda Civic of 10 or 15 years ago. And you don't reverse technology changes when prices drop. In North America, we had reached saturation level of driving distances. People in big cities would not drive to work any farther. They would relocate. American oil demand peaked in 2006. Horizontal drilling and the benefits that that brings of additional reserves and additional recovery is here to stay. And just a few, few more numbers. So remaining reserves worldwide of oil went from 37 years to 53 years in about a 30 year period. And during that same period of time, consumption went up 25%. So we not only have a lot more absolutely, we have a lot more oil relatively left to supply economies. So security of oil supply has never been better globally. Lots of reserves, too much production, which way do prices have to go? They have to go down. I'm going to digress here for a minute on Canada again. Where does Canada fit into this? We're the number five producer for oil and gas, pretty significant. We are an energy superpower as our former prime minister used to want to talk about it a great deal, but we're only there because we're number two in reserves and almost all of those reserves, 90, 90 something percent, are in the oil sands. Those are high cost and they're the toughest ones to get cost down because almost all the money you have to spend to develop this is above ground. You can't apply much subsurface ingenuity to that resource. There's only five countries, five or six countries in the world, Canada being one of them, they are self-sufficient in both food and energy. And in our country, our share of global CO2 emissions has gone from 2.1% in 2005 to 1.2% in 
to 1.8% in 2010, and it's expected to go to 1.6% in 2020. There's many, way to, many ways to look at emissions, but from a relative share, we are making relative progress. So somewhere in the middle of 2014, the world's largest producer, and there are three of them, Saudi Arabia being the largest, United States is in the same category, Russia is in the same category, they produce similar levels, but the Saudi Arabia has a very unique characteristic, very low cost. Somewhere between five and $20 to deliver a barrel to market, full cost, operating capital, everything. In Canada, we need 50 to 90, depending on the kind of production you have. So by the autumn of 2014, Saudi Arabia shifts from a strategy of supply management to manage price to market share management to deal with the competitors they created with their high price policy, horizontal drillers, oil sands guys, deep water guys. Their goal is not to stress these competitors. Their goal is to kill them. These are terminologies sometimes I would even hear in a boardroom. Now, price management by supply management is precisely what Campotex does in Saskatchewan. You guys should understand OPEC better than anybody. So why did, shift? Why this shift? Why did Saudi Arabia make this shift? Well, back to this 40 years of production declines being replaced in seven. If they would have allowed that trend to continue in 10 to 15 years, they would have had no place to sell any of their crude. Zero. At high oil prices, North America in 10 to 15 years would have self, been, been self-sufficient. So Saudi Arabia has somewhere between 50 and 100 years of reserves left. They don't disclose it. There's no accounting rules in that country. There's no, you know, there's no SEC to tell us what the truth is, but it's a lot. And if they cut their production today to increase prices, as some people speculate, they will again help everybody but themselves. They will enable their competitors. They are the low-cost producer. It makes no sense for the low-cost producer to cut their production so the high-cost producer continue to enhance their business. When things go down, the first guy out of the market should be the high-cost producer. The low-cost producer gets to be the last one playing the game. Their plan is to monetize their oil and gas as quickly as possible. They have more rigs working in the country than any time in the past three decades. And they, say, they themselves say the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Hydrocarbons are a sunset business. Not in the next 30 years, not likely in the next 50 years, I'm not sure even in the next 80 years. And maybe the Saudis have it wrong. Maybe they'll look back 150 years and we'll be telling the coal story I started with. Industry here did what it's supposed to do. Price went up, market said it needs more, we found more, we just found lots more. There's a big winner here, and everybody knows who that is. It's the consumer. But you know, I did not get many good job Marv thank you cards from my relatives. I'm still waiting for those in the crowd here. Please send me the cards. But the consequences of this shift are significant. The loss in, in, these rev, loss in revenues to Alberta and Canada is $200 million a day, at least. Think of the staggering amounts. This money was going to pay dividends, salaries, rigs, taxes. And the negative impacts tend to be very focused. They tend to be very focused in Alberta, somewhat in Saskatchewan. The way oil is distributed across Canada, Alberta's got about 90%, Saskatchewan has about 10%. And the positive impacts are distributed quite broadly across society. So yes, consumers in Canada are winning, but we are an energy exporter, net energy exporter, and so we are exporting that benefit to the United States. And the United States is double winning. We subsidize them about $35 billion a year, $1,000 per year for every Canadian, because we can't get pipelines built. I talked to a politician, and his view is the most significant political failure in the last 100 years is the failure to deal with native land claims 50 years, 100 years ago. 
So today, we can't even put a pipe in the ground that is one of the most benign activities if you can think of an industrial nature. So what should we do about this dilemma? Is this a problem? We have to decide if this is a problem. Let me share a few perspectives. Consumers are big winners here. And I believe the environment could be a big winner here if governments would choose to impose some carbon taxes because there's room to do those. However, you have to take the proceeds and you have to invest them in technologies that have potential to reduce carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, or get you off hydrocarbons. Democracies are winners. In the world of oil distribution, importers are significantly more democratic than exporters. Canada and Norway are exceptions. Our energy in the oil sands here is so high cost, I do not believe we will see another from scratch, grassroots, oil sands plant, oil sands development in my lifetime. Horizontal drilling is just too effective. There's still lots of room for technological legs to develop on that. It's more efficient. But on a more practical level, even if we wanted to do something about these problems, we have relatively few tools that could have any impact on this issue. So what are the leadership lessons from this? Number one is build some financial buffers when times are good. And secondly, not every problem in life, politics, or business has a solution. And if you try to tackle one of these, your likely outcome is to waste resources. The world is a very uncertain place. And because we take control of so many things in our lives, when we eat, when we sleep, when we rise, where we go to work, the temperature, everything is controlled. We have agendas of extraordinary sophistication. We're in charge. This gives us a false sense of control over the variability in both the physical world and the financial world. And I'll choose a far out example. We nearly annihilated a whole continent when that half a kilometer meteorite swung by the Earth from an unexpected orbit that a student found around Halloween. We live in an uncertain world. And one of my most toughest lessons in business was to accept uncertainty and appreciate when you could or couldn't do something about it. And one of the corollaries of this uncertainty and trying to do something about it in the business world, and this is ubiquitous in, very, in almost every culture in every country, every success needs a hero and every failure needs a villain. This logic is defective, but unfortunately pervasive. Young graduates don't fall for this. Some of my biggest challenges at Nexon were caused by the 2008 financial crisis. 150 bucks old boss, 35 bucks new boss. The Arab Spring stressed our entire business in the Middle East. A fruit vendor in Tunisia setting himself on fire led to this chain effects. Had all kinds of weak signals this part of the world might have challenges. Very sophisticated reports but you never knew when it was going to be set off. People have been writing about the imminent collapse of the feudal monarchy they have in Saudi Arabia for 50 years, and they're still going strong. BP's blowout in Macondo. We were one of the only Canadian companies that was a deep water driller. It affected our business. I had to shut down rigs, had to renegotiate rig contracts because they didn't have clear out clauses on what happens if you have this kind of event. I would say all of these surprises were outside the conventional framework of risk management. There was no on-the-shelf plan to deal with this. What do you do with this thing comes from nowhere that no one would have ever predicted? Because it's a surprise. By definition, it's unpredictable. And the best tool that we had was we had cash in the bank, some financial dry powder that we could weather this totally un unpredicted storm basic and effective. When I left Nexon, there was over a billion dollars cash in the bank and we had unbelievable pressure from all of our shareholders to dividend it out. So the other big surprise 
during this period was we didn't expect oil to rocket from 20 to 100 bucks. We bought bigger computers so we could count all the money. The new owners of Nexon can now sell these computers to the government of Alberta to count all the debt. Ooh, I think I'm falling into that businessman's rut I talked about earlier. Tempting and easy. And today I'm very happy to be on this side of retirement as oil rockets from 100 bucks to 20 bucks. But the Chinese, the new owners of Nexon, they too will find a way to manage through of this. Where we're likely headed, and I did an interview on CBC Radio, and I spend time with my lovely sister here, and she's wonderful to host me when I come here regularly to Saskatoon. But she says, you know, Marvin, you did a wonderful interview. You were clear, you were thoughtful, you're really on top of your game. But why didn't you talk about the future a little bit? My sister gives you good feedback. Where are we headed for a world where I believe OPEC and Saudi Arabia will produce to the maximum and oil prices, and everyone asks me what the oil price will be, but very few people ask me what will drive the determination of oil price. Oil price, I believe, will be determined by how many horizontal wells we need in the United States to supply the market once the low-cost producers are filled and what those horizontal wells will need to make a decent rate of return their cost of capital. This is a much more rational world than the one we lived in. We're going to probably see 30 to 40 bucks for three years, and then maybe we'll creep up to 50 or 60, and then the horizontal drillers will become innovative, they'll drive this cost down, and I think we're going to see very modest prices. There are risks to this scenario that I paint to you, and I don't have time to talk to them. It is not certain what I shared with you will happen. But this is a much more rational mechanism for determining the price of this important commodity. But in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, and in Canada, we will not have the financial resources we have historically come to count on. And I believe this will be more challenging than we are anticipating at this time. So recently, we're in the home stretch here. I'm not going to beat the hour and a half, Carl. The world recently met in Paris to deal with the byproduct of the energy intensive societies we have built, carbon dioxide emissions and climate change. This was the most complicated issue I had to work on in my time at Nexon, and it spanned my career for maybe the last 20 years I had some involvement with this file. This issue has social context, it has political context, it has strategic contrast, context, it has enormous financial context, and occasionally it had environmental components. Over 80% of carbon emissions worldwide occur at the consumer level. Drive a car, buy California fruits and vegetables, order on Amazon, as I frequently do now because I'm on the right side of retirement, run a furnace in winter, an air conditioner in summer, and you are making carbon dioxide, period. If we continue to focus our efforts in society at the production level, which produces about 20% of the carbon emissions, no matter how clever, how thoughtful, how complex these plans we are, we will not be successful. Today's front page headline in the Globe and Mail, not the front of the business section, the front of the front page says, energy projects require a climate test, LNG projects. They're going to require a new climate test. I have nothing against that. We should do our fair share. We should chin up and do even a little more than the consumer. I have no problem with that. But the absence of the focus on the consumer level who produces 80% is a big head fake. And I would encourage you to think about this, not fall for this. The problem is that consumers vote. And as I mentioned, they want it all, but they would love someone else to pay. There have been surveys done with how much people are willing to pay out of their pocket to reduce climate emissions. I would shock you by how little they're prepared to pay, but what they want. In my entire 35-year career in the oil and gas industry, there was not a single thing I could do to increase demand for the products that I sold. I could simply supply what the consumers demanded and what they needed. The consumer drives our business. 
And that's where we have to focus our attention if we are gonna make progress on this problem that the world appears united on that we wanna make. You engineers in the room will be at the forefront of these energy solutions, and I encourage you in this area. It will be rich and a fertile experience. I cannot predict exactly where it will go and the kind of things we will find, but I'm highly, highly confident we're gonna be using hydrocarbons for a long time and needing to deal with the consequences that they cause. We will not return to the Stone Age. We will not get off hydrocarbons, but let me give you, as my good sister advised me, what are some of the futures, Marvin, here? Well, I think we could use some simple policy mechanism, such as a carbon tax, and taking those proceeds and, and investing them in alternate technologies that would help us manage carbon, carbon use, and it's carbon use is the hydrocarbon and the carbon dioxide is the mission, doing both of those things. Carbon taxes are a very tough sell to consumers. The politicians do not tell you the surveys that have been done in this territory, but British Columbia had the courage to do it, and they had the courage to make it revenue neutral. But they didn't take a lot of the proceeds from this and apply it to off-hydrocarbon technologies. No, Alberta has announced, we're going to do it. Consumers, producers, producers are going to pay a lot more than consumers, but consumers are going to pay. They didn't promise it would be revenue neutral, and they didn't make many commitments to invest in off-hydrocarbon ideas. And one of the challenge of investing in these off-hydrocarbon ideas, and the faculties in this room, the, the, the technical faculties understand this deeply, of how many difficult failures you will have to fund that will consume a lot of money to find the gems that get you out the other end. You need a cast iron stomach for dealing with that. And I'm not sure our society and democracies are actually structured well for that. I want to conclude with a few personal experiences and how they made a difference in my life. It's easy to talk about third parties and the business and all of that stuff. And as I talk about this, I will try not to dislocate my shoulder as I pat myself on the back. And if I get choked up, it's just because I have not worn a necktie in six months and I have this lovely tartan tie. In high school, I was a good student. My parents had it easy. Now, unfortunately, they're both gone, so they can neither hear me or challenge me. And although we were of very, very modest means, I never had a day in my young life where I didn't feel a sense of love, a sense of family, a sense of community. I never got it at the time. I never realized it, but everybody was on my side. It freed me to succeed at my job at that time, and that was to be a successful student. Later in life, I always felt the support of my wife, almost 40 years, and my children. In high school, teachers gave me extra work. Maybe they thought I could do it. Maybe they didn't get bored. They didn't want me to get bored. Maybe they were bored. I'm not sure. I never asked, I can't remember. But one of the things I remember with unbelievable clarity is I worked my buns off because I did not want to disappoint them. This I remember like it happened yesterday. And I wish I would have understood at the time the enormous power I received when someone else believed in me. Too soon old, too late smart, as the title of a very nice book goes. It's, how, it's however insufficient to believe in yourself or have your spouse, your partner, your family believe in you. That's not enough. They are both consciously and subconsciously unbelievably biased. Find somebody at work who believes in you, hang on to them with a tight grip, you will understand the power of being self-propelled. I decided to go to the University of Saskatchewan because it was shortest drive from Kenora, Saskatchewan. Quite a decision criteria. No mom and dad flying me around the planet to find the school that I could achieve self-actualization. Later in my career, I was fortunate enough to study at Harvard. And late in my career, I went to the best business school in Europe before I became CEO. It was unheard of that a late career executive would want to go to school. I did. I learned a lot. 
And one, one of the things I discovered as a businessman, as an engineer, there were no gaps in my education, in my training, and in my experience. When you young adults leave this institution, you have everything you need to be successful anywhere, period. At school, teachers told me I was smart. At university, professors told me I was smart. I went through a tour and they've all retired or died and I couldn't find anyone to recall correctly whether I had that recollection correct. <laughs> I scored 100% in first year calculus due to the kindness and wisdom of a great professor. That's another story for a business school talk. The 100% was very fuzzy on my transcript because those digits are so seldom used when we had these mechanical printers. I was proud, oh, maybe arrogant, uh, probably arrogant, certainly arrogant, <laughs> certainly arrogant. Thank you for that chuckle. Smart is not your friend. It's not your enemy. Smart is like a warm, sunny day. It feels so good. It fills your body with vitamin D while it quietly burns your skin to a crisp. <laughs> Remember the comment about a strength taken too far? We were talking at about our table tonight. Engineering is one of the most difficult disciplines you can study at university. I don't know if it's precisely the toughest. I think it is, but I'm biased as heck. To make it through, you have to be smart. You have to be really smart. All of you young graduates, as you leave this institution, I want you to take an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. I have concrete suggestion for you. Write on that piece of paper, I am smart. Use the whole page. Use a felt pen with a thick tip. Roll it up, put it in an empty wine bottle, and throw it out. I was going to say throw it in the ocean, but then I thought, Marvin, I'll get you in all kinds of environmental trouble with all those floating, <laughs> floating bottles. Take a second piece of paper, just as big, same felt pen, write on it, I will be useful today. Take that piece of paper, stick it on your mirror for the next 35 years, and when you get up in the morning to shave, put on your lipstick, or like I have to do, comb my hair, <laughs> it will propel you. I am very worried all of my friends in the audience will rush the stage as soon as I'm done with the wine bottles and say, put your note in there, Marv, put your note in there, Marv. Self-awareness and self-management never ends. It's a journey. You're not going to fix your faults. That's okay. It's not needed. Be aware of them. Get other people to give you a hand. Don't overuse your strength. When you show up for your work in the next five to ten years and your boss gives you assignments, encourage you by all means, ask lots of questions, but when you leave, your six most powerful words will be, I got it, I'm on it, then deliver. I don't care if you work in a university, in a commercial environment, in the civil service, those are your six most powerful words. When you move into leadership roles and your employees or you start your own business and your partners and your peers give you good ideas, especially if these ideas come from below, your most powerful words will be, young graduates, I got it, I'm on it, then deliver. When your spouse asks you to take out the garbage, what do you say? Honey, I'm working on my C.J. McKenzie lecture. I have no time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, approach your futures with a warm heart and a clear head. You have everything you need to be successful, however you choose to define success. Get after it. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>